you're on mute, Pip. <laughs> unmute yourself. So I am. I was expecting you to unmute me. Good morning, good evening, everybody. Um, good evening, Pip. It's a dark November morning here uh, in the United Kingdom. We're not a very United Kingdom, as you probably know. And uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about the Online Therapeutic Alliance. And thank you to Rene for inviting me. Just going to get my slideshow ready and do screen share. Um, and uh, so uh, it's always alarming talking to a blank screen because I like to be able to talk to people. Um, and of course, this is the whole thing about presence, isn't it? So what I want you to notice today um, is whether not being able to talk to me or to, and that, that all, most people's screens are turned off has any impact on your uh, attention or on the way that you, you view the relationships that are growing between the group of us that are here. We're only a small group, but I'm sure there'll be other people watching later on. So um, for me, uh, online therapy, the delivery of online therapy uh, ha has been um, one of the most important things of the 21st century. Um, and today I'm just going to split this into two parts. Uh, well, it's split naturally into two parts. One part will be on the practical digital building blocks through creating the Therapeutic Alliance. And the second part is the relational part, as Sula calls it, be here now. Um, now, normally in a presentation like this, I'd suddenly stop and say, and now we'll do an exercise together. But I don't think that will be happening today. But hopefully on Thursday, those of you that can bear to stay till that late at night will uh, be able to uh, join me for some exercises. We'll see how we get, get on today. Part two will be the end of part of this on Thursday. So I hope you'll join us. Ultimately, creating presence is the heart of the matter. Without presence online, and nothing can happen. Now, you'll already be noticing through the blank screens that presence is beginning to happen between us. You're beginning to listen or not listen, but this is the beginning of presence. And there's some building blocks in place. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so, of course, I can't ignore the whole COVID conversation. And I'm delighted to see that New South Wales has done a lot better than our bumbling Boris in the management of COVID. And uh, we have something like um, uh, 55,000 deaths and 20,000 new cases a day at the moment, and you don't. So the, the politics in Australia may be a bit different around this than in the UK, um, but worldwide, COVID has dramatically and suddenly changed online therapy. Not long after I came back from Sydney in, at the end of January, um, uh, COVID exploded all over the place and uh, uh, a friend, uh, a, a, a psychotherapy friend of mine called Tree Staunton, she sent me an email. I hadn't heard from her in five years. And she just wrote me a very short email when COVID took over and she said, Pippa, this is your time. And what she meant was this was the, our time, the time for online therapy finally to take hold. And just in case you thought this was a new modality, you know, we've all been working with computers since the mid 80s. Uh, Kate Anthony has been working online since the 1990s and so on and so on. So, you know, there's nothing new about this, but but online therapy suddenly grew up in March this year, as did my business, which grew by 540 percent this year. Um, however, there are some big questions uh, to ask when you suddenly have to change how you're working. You don't just go online and hope for the best. Um, and these are the questions. And, and really, I think these questions should be pinned across e above each of our desks to think about, because ultimately the care of our clients is the most important thing. So these are all part of the building blocks. These are not the sexy bit about presence. These are the building blocks of presence. How can I provide therapy safely online? And how can I aid my clients to work safely online? Because 
if I'm not working safely online, your client's not going to stay. They're going to feel very unheld. And online is not just a matter of turning on the video and going off. There are many things to do. So I'd like you to think about those questions. I don't want to answer them today because I think that's a completely separate lecture about risk assessment and measures and uh, safeguarding and all that. How can I be sure that I can safely access my therapy space online? And how can we be sure that our clients safely access their therapy online? Well, that is stuff I have control over. Well, that's certainly the first part. So the first part is about how we uh, go online, how we use the digital technology online. And this is entirely within your control, as you'll see today, entirely. But it is also our responsibility to make sure that our clients can safely access the therapy online. And if they can't work out the technology or they, they don't have a private space at home, you're going to need to adapt straight away. One of the things that's quite interesting is I was reading the statistics the other day about uh, how many people in the world apparently have digital technology. You know, the st I think the, the figure in the United Kingdom they're saying is something like 97% of people have access to digital technology. Well, I think some of these figures are not as high as people think. One of the things we've learned this year, and I have trained legions of children, young people therapists this, this year since March, uh, all of whom had to go and work online, mainly in very deprived areas of the UK, many of whom between them don't even have more than one mobile phone if they've even got a smartphone. So, so actually, digital technology uh, reinforces uh, some of the social deprivations because it, those very people who most need the digital technology support don't even have access to it. This is fundamental. Am I working within my limits of competence? So in March, all our professional membership bodies in the UK said, just get online. Don't worry about anything. Just get online. Just see your clients. Just get online. Actually, that was very foolish because many people got online who hadn't a clue what they were doing. And I know in the academy, uh, and I teach every day in the academy, we've actually had to restructure our courses. And you're, you might on Thursday see some elements of that. Um, and I've now had to include quite a lot of digital technology teaching, like how to use Zoom. Last night in my diploma teaching, I actually spent the whole evening doing uh, working through our digital technology competence tech checklist. Well, actually, we didn't go through the whole thing. We did aspects of it. Um, what the feedback from all our therapists in training with us was, my goodness, I thought I knew what I was doing. And I had now realized I, I know very little. Well, that's a really good start point when people admit they know very little. And knowing the limits of your competence is something required by your ethical framework. And I'm sure that's the case all over the world. It certainly is in every UK based one. Um, and so when we work online, we add all the usual face to face competencies that are required. And on top of that, we layer the digital aspects. That, that are required, both in the building blocks of how do you get onto Zoom or Teams or whatever you're getting onto, how do you make the technology work, but also how you, you transform your modality. And I'm going to talk about that a bit later on, because I fundamentally disagree with the word adapt. You know, people uh, adapting a bit of technology, it's a bit like adapting a uh, uh, um, a, a piece of kit to suddenly have electricity attached to it. It never works. You have to rethink it from scratch. So the, the, in these three questions, it's about knowing where your limits of competence are and going to get the help you need. Our ethical framework remains the go-to place at all times, whether it's an online framework or a face-to-face -face one, a good ethical framework will cover all aspects and modalities and delivery formats. So Susan Simpson, one of my favourite people who did a lot of her work in South Australia at the University of Adelaide, South Australia, has recently published a new paper, which is in the references at the end and the references in full down here. And uh, I would recommend you read everything that she has written. But 
uh, her latest paper, which is called Video Therapy and Therapeutic Alliance in the Age of COVID-19, um, summarizes really some of the former work. But what's good is that she's given us a 2020 look over. So the bit that is important is in green, but I'm going to read the quote because the whole quote is important. This previously unimaginable set of circumstances, COVID, I've added, provides a unique opportunity and indeed an imperative for video therapy to fulfill its potential in addressing mental health and well-being needs from a distance. Historically, the uptake of video therapy has been hindered by psychotherapist expectations of inferior therapeutic alliance and outcomes, in spite of considerable research evidence to the contrary. Research suggests that video therapy provides a powerful pathway for clients to experience enhanced opportunities for self-expression, connection and intimacy. This more neutral therapeutic space provides clients with multifarious opportunities for self-awareness, creative experience and collaboration with potentially a greater sense of agency over their own experience. All of this is supported by everything I've learned in online therapy and everything I've experienced. So thank you to Susan for an update. This is going to be a historically important paper for you to use as your evidence. And you'll all be really pleased that it's an Australian one. Now, this is what I think. I think that this was an entirely avoidable situation. And therapists often feel entirely inadequate and de-skilled because they can't use the technology because they don't understand it. And what I'm, what, one of the points I want to make very firmly is it's not their stroke, your stroke, our fault. This is the Simpson quote picked up again. And this means that as a result of our own de-skill, we can't possibly believe that anybody else can can find online therapy useful. But it's actually, a, it's certainly in the UK, failure by successive governments to train our population in working digitally. Do you know, I first had my work computer, a work computer in 1985. It's disgraceful that 35 years later, people can't do simple tasks like copy and paste on a computer. Failure by our psychotherapy and counselling and uh, organisations to consider working digitally seriously. I left psychology out of this list deliberately because I actually think psychology has done a bit better. Failure by psychotherapy and counselling training uh, professional membership bodies. So the, the, the word training is not necessarily there. Professional membership bodies to consider working uh, digitally seriously. They just didn't take it seriously. They laughed. Absolutely. I mean, you know, um, I was on the I am a member of the uh, psychotherapy and counselling union in the UK and I some, put something up about one of my courses, a, a diploma course, a very serious 1500 quid course. And one of the members of the union put up, thanks for warning us, I'll tell my, my therapist to avoid this at all costs. That's the sort of uh, hysteria that was around created such a negative situation for online therapy. You know, it's considered a geek, an oddity, uh, and at the very margins of therapy. It can't possibly work was the most important thing I heard. It didn't matter how many Susan Simpson articles I'd trot out. It was an in entirely avoidable crisis if they would only invested in digital technology. We'd all have a lot more jobs as well now in COVID. My business has grown by 540%. So would other digital businesses. So we've, you know, you, we've used computers for a long time. And therapeutically, we've been using computers for a long time. Even back in the 1990s, uh, the Samaritans were working with young men, suicidal young men, using email therapy um, because they worked out that that was the best way to get to them without uh, somehow the, the shame element coming in. Kate Anthony did her doctorate in 1993. Now, Kate Anthony, I consider the queen of online therapy, you know, and she has been banging the drum for this ever since, but has been considered one of those weirdos on the edge. 
But all this changed. But it, this was an entirely avoidable situation. And I feel very sorry for our therapists now because they feel de-skilled at a time when actually they should have good skills to do this. And I'm not going to put up all the charts for this, but I have given you um, the information. Norcross, there are three go-to articles that I think everybody should read. Uh, video Therapy uh, and Therapeutic Alliance by um, Susan Simpson et al. Norcross et al. on the future of psychotherapy. This was a forecast given in 2013. It's actually what they expected by 2022. And the third article that I think every online therapist should read is Some New Challenges by Carl Rogers, written in 1972. It ends the word something like, do I dare? And the answer is, yes, we must, on behalf of our clients. And what's interesting about this, written in 2010, published in 2013, was that the five predicted changes in therapy interventions are the arrival of online therapies, smartphone applications, self-help resources beyond books, virtual realities, and social networking interventions. If you go back to 2010, you'll realize that social networking started not that long before then. So this was very visionary that they came up with this. And why is it that this was entirely ignored? Okay, and uh, we know that the efficacy of online therapy is there. So here we come onto the current context of COVID, the impact on the clients, the therapists, and supervisees, those poor supervisees who are languishing in the wilderness with no training about doing anything digitally, but are required by their ethical framework to be able to work within their limits of competence. And we in the UK, ha we have a directory of online supervisors and um, we now have a, 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 a levelling in ACTO that requires um, our senior professional members to have online supervision. Uh, as part of their offering. Um, but we've got lots of opportunities that have come out of all this. Uh, this year, last year, seen the arrival of the ACTO competencies. Uh, we'll see those come up again later. Um, and the supervision competencies that have just been um, put together um, for ACTO. Um, and this is the newest thing, is now the ACTO different level so that training is rewarded. Because if you're going to be good at presence and, and building your therapeutic frame, you've got to be trained. This doesn't happen by accident. OK. Now, this also means that we have to think about ourselves much more. Self-care is far more important than it ever was before. And it's more complicated than a quadratic equation. More of that later. Uh, and I feel very honoured and privileged to be working in this time. And I'm sure Rene and Annette, who I know are on the stream with us, feel the same way. Um, they trained with the Academy as well. Um, and uh, I'm just going to zoom on through some of these um, to some of the things that we're offering that will help. So in terms of some practical skills, we've got some courses. When you receive this um, PowerPoint, uh, these are all hyperlinks, so you'll be able to link straight into things. And what we do have now is we've put a digital technology competence uh, checklist together. Um, and um, I'm just going to stop the screen share um, to go to my web page. This is always a dangerous thing to do. Um, let me just get it up. Um, hang on. And... <clears throat> Where's it gone? No, there we go. And I'm just going to re screen share that so that you can see that. And this is our, our, um, our um, page where, hang on, I can't see anybody now. I've got to move everything across. Um, this is our page where all the um, resources are on our website ACAD Therapy to Online Useful Resources. And if you click on resources, um, if you click into here, and down here is the digital technology competence checklist, and then it's a download. Um, and I'll just open it up. That will require me to change the screen share again, um, but I'll just do that as soon as it's opened. 
Now it hasn't opened yet, so it always takes a bit of time to do these things, irritatingly. Okay, here we go. And there's a bit of instructions here. And all we're doing is we're suggesting you rate these. So uh, how you invite a client to Zoom securely, creating a meeting management list. Okay, if you do use Zoom, but you've never thought about that, you might put a, a, a put a, 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 I need to do enable editing. Uh, you, you might click this and it's done in such a way that you can tick it. Uh, it's not gonna let me because I'm on the screen share. Um, and in, uh, in a couple of um, months time, you'd want to go back to that again and have another go at it so that you can see how much you've improved. So I've just shown you the first one, there's, there's 20 of them, but you can download that from the internet and play with that to your heart's content. It's a free download for everybody. Okay, so we've talked, I've talked about how the online therapist requires transformation. This is not adaptation, it's major transformation. And um, uh, it, it is a serious matter. And, and Adrian Rhodes in a, in a recent talk, and he's the chair of UKCP, uh, sorry, of ACTO. He was the vice chair of UKCP. He's now the chair of ACTO. And he was uh, lecturing on, on, on an aspect. And, you know, and he's a psychoanalytic psychotherapist. This is a group that's the most one of the most resistant groups to go working online. Um, but not our Adrian, thank goodness. And he um, he talked about actually how important it was not to just turn on the video, but actually you have to strip your modality back and rethink everything you're doing in a, an exciting and new way. It's not a, an adaptation job. It's a real rethinking. Uh, so, so that the delivery that the online therapy that we're delivering is based in gravitas. We all know how effective online therapy is, but we have to, everything we deliver has to be based on research based and based in gravitas. So I talked earlier about the ACTO online uh, competencies and here is the list of them. And I think this is really important to consider because if you fail to grasp any one of these, and you know you could uh, argue about whether these make any sense together for example number nine endings and supervision in online therapy i don't like them being together um and there's another one i don't like being together number six text-based communication and creativity because i think they're two separate things but hey ho um the key thing is if you don't have competence in each of these 10 areas actually it's probably more when you break them down but 10 across these formats, video, audio, live chat, email. We'd always say that it, where possible, it's the client's choice to use the format they want. So if a client says to you, I wanna work by a live chat, you'll either have to say, I'm so sorry, I'm not able to use that because I'm not competent to use it. You might use other words, but you know, essentially you might say, I'm not able to, I haven't had a training in it. Um, but where possible, you, you should allow the client to be the person who chooses the format delivery, which is why learning the four formats is so important. When we start our diploma course, we've got about 20 students on our diploma course at the moment. And when we started week one, they'd, they'd all gone for video. They'd all said, oh no, video is the only way. And uh, last week they did an exercise in groups, which makes it even harder using live chat. So live chat, just to clarify, is not WhatsApp, not Signal. It, it's via a computer. So, for example, Zoom using the chat facility and you've both got your audio and your video turned off, as most of you have at the moment. Um, and they, I put them into groups and they did a, a chat session based on uh, discussing how they use groups. And I, I did warn them to be kind because one of the biggest things when you start this work on live chat is, is, is people, uh, the emotions run away, disinhibition, which we'll hear about a bit later, runs away. And I said, be kind to each other, be, you know, be thoughtful. And as they, uh, and I waited online for them to come out of their groups, and as they came out, I said, well, how, how, how was that? 
And they all went, wow, that was so interesting. And suddenly they'd understood the power and the intimacy of working via live chat. The general view is that live chat strips away intimacy because you're losing yet another sense. But actually, it doesn't. It's a deeply powerful way of delivering therapy in the right context. So that I wanted to pick out particularly. Um, email is immensely powerful in the right context, but it requires a huge amount of training. Um, it isn't just a matter of sending emails back and forward. First of all, you'd probably send them without having uh, having them in a secured way, for example, and thinking about all the different ways in which you can do them. So all these different aspects, and I just want to pick out here on online uh, supervision because supervision has has taken a bit of a hit in this. Um, in the UK, until recently, we had less than 20 online trained supervisors. So you can imagine in March what a crisis it was because uh, in ACTO, we encourage everybody to have online supervision. The senior professional members have to have it. So that's Renee's type level, Renee um, and, and, and that type things. You'd, you'd be having to have online supervision because the, um, the uh, again, the guidelines say that you should receive supervision in the format, uh, online supervision in the format that you're delivering your therapy. So if you're delivering therapy via live chat, you'll need some supervision via live chat. Quite interesting. But everybody needs to be having some online supervision by somebody who knows about it, who can say, I've got a client in, in Zimbabwe. What does this mean? Am I safe to work with this client? Is this client safe to work with me? Etc. Uh, and on we go. So I just started learning swimming. And um, uh, I did a little poll around my, my diploma class last night and about out of 20, about four people could do the crawl. But most of it, uh, I just looked like a disaster, but I've been learning. So what I learned is that at 64, learning the crawl's not easy and it's not a pretty sight. And it takes about 20 hours to teach an adult um, the crawl. And there are five independent but interlinked items to learn, all these things. So I can do any one of those at one time. I might be able to do two of them at one time. But you asked me to do four of those at one time, disaster hit. And of course, the ultimate thing is number five is the timing. And, you know, that's a disaster. And um, the point about what we're talking about here is that it's like learning the crawl. You have to learn the digital skills separately and bolt them together, um, just like learning the crawl. And we have to nail these before we can even start to consider Sula's be here now in his chapter on presence, which is required reading for everybody. So thinking a little bit about self-care, this ties into some of these building blocks as well. Um, so I, I just have a little think, okay, I love my little chappy here because there's everything bad about him. He must have wrist ache and neck ache and back ache and eye ache and he's not wearing a headset. You can hear all sorts of noise coming out everywhere. There's everything wrong with this. So I'm not going to do this in detail, but I think you should do this slide in detail. And uh, the one I am going to come down to down here is to be aware of the boundary between home and work when working from home. It's really important to think about that. Last night, we did an analysis of screens. It was very interesting. Um, but making boundaries between your home and work when you work from home is really important. Notice I've got on a virtual background at the moment. Not brilliant because my chair creeps in. I'm just going to make it happen. Um, but, you know, really think about this if you've got a tatty room or whatever. And... So now thinking about coffee tables. So say Rennie and I went out with Annette in Sydney and we were down in the rocks having a coffee. And we were at one of those wobbly tables, you know, at one of those outside bars. And uh, so we got the coffee and because we put the coffee cups on the table and the table's wobbly. So 
the coffee's starting to drip everywhere. Um, and, and, and so Rennie's under the table, putting bar mats under the uh, uh, beer mats under the legs and so on. It's an irritation. The table took away from our communication. From We wouldn't notice the table. We'd be deep in our conversation. We wouldn't notice the table. But the table takes over and becomes the focus. And is a deep irritation. And this is what happens when things go wrong digitally uh, or we haven't got things well worked out te with t digital technology. What we're aiming is that the technology parts are seamless so that actually you can just be present for your client. And uh, I love talking about the therapeutic frame and the creation of screen presence. So Lombard and Ditton, I usually say to everybody, you shouldn't use references that are more than 10 years old for online therapy. Uh, they're, they're already pretty old at 10 years old. A student of mine wrote a, a review of John Suler's 2016 book yesterday. And I was very amused to see that she, she in her final paragraph, said she thought it was a bit outdated. <laughs> uh, I went, what? It's only five years old and it's brilliant. But uh, it was an interesting comment about, and, and digitally, so much changes so quickly. But this Lombard and Ditton article, which is about the different types of screen present, is really interesting. It's mainly drawn from film and television. But it's absolutely nailed the different types of presence, which we're not going to do so much of today. But I've included them in the slides so you can go and read the summaries. So the definition of presence can be applied to any medium, a medium that becomes invisible and produces a perceptual illusion, uh, analogous to an open window, which can provide rich verbal and nonverbal information for social interaction, presence of social richness. Objects and entities in such a medium should appear perceptually, if not socially, vivid and real, presence as realism. This, the illusion that there is no medium at work means there is no border between this side and the other side of the medium. So users can perceive that they have moved to the other side. The objects and entities from the other side have entered their immediate environment or that they and other users are sharing a real or artificial environment presence as transportation. The illusion of non-mediation will be more complete if the medium is perceptually and psychologically immersive presence as emotion. So there's much more than what I'm just reading here. These are a bit sum a summary slide, but it's a great article to read. And it made me think about how the, you know, when we watch TV programs, the presenters are trained to talk to us in our own homes. And we make friends with those presenters. We feel we know them. And uh, I was in a supervision group last week and they were doing a role play uh, live supervision. And this, uh, so one of my supervisees was talking about a client and the supervisor, well, another of the supervisees was role playing the, 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 the therapist. And he suddenly said, now, look, look over your screen at your husband and talk to him. And it was such a moving moment because this wasn't rehearsed or planned or thought through. But he used the technology in such a way, it was almost a gestalt based thing, like having a chair there, but doing it in an invisible way. He used the screen, said, look beyond the screen to your husband. Uh, how powerful was that? And so, again, it's a way of playing with the screen. I noticed that quite a lot of people have dirty cameras. It's really or, or cameras that are very uh, fuzzy. And I'm going to show you. Uh, what would happen if I change uh, camera? So here we go. I'm going to change camera. So you immediately see something that looks completely different. I do have my Sydney Thunder shirt on for today, by the way, for those of you who are into cricket. Um, I'm going to go back to, to, to the other camera, but the colours are not right on this. And uh, I'm a bit more fuzzy. Um, and so I invested, and now you see the difference. And I invested in a 99 quid camera. Well, that's quite expensive for a camera, it's made by Logi. And that is the difference. And it is crystal clear because the, if you've got a film or anything that makes it look like there's a 
film between you, you lose this sense of the open window, which is part of the creation of therapeutic presence. You're wanting to create the open window at all times so that there's an invisibility of screen between you. And when you get deeply into material, that, that screen disappears completely anyway. So I'm not going to go through these screen slides, um, but these are the, diff the Lombard and uh, Bittens uh, in uh, different ways of, of developing um, uh, presence. Um, and I'll leave you to summarize on those, but I wanted to move on to um, more about presence at the heart of the online therapeutic frame, OTF, the online therapeutic frame. So Gela, uh, 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 describes therapeutic presence as, it, uh, sorry, it says is defined in part as bringing one's whole self into the encounter with a client, being completely in the moment on a multiplicity of levels, physically, emotionally, cognitively, spiritually, and relationally. And I'm adding to that digitally as well. You know, when you go to the cinema and you watch an absolutely, truly brilliant film, you're in it. You're not looking at the screen, you're in it. You're completely in it. When you read a book, you're in it. And this is what we're creating when we're working online with our clients. Rogers had a really interesting conversation with Michelle Baldwin towards the end of his life on the use of self in therapy. Because one of the things I say is that if you do nothing else in online work, stick to Rogers' core conditions and you'll not go wrong as the underpinning. Whatever your modality, whether you're a psychoanalytic psychotherapist or a CBT therapist or anything in between all that, just go back and read Rogers' core conditions and you won't go wrong. Being present for your client. But actually what Rogers said, he said, over time, I think I've become aware of the fact that in therapy, I do use myself. Well, there's a surprise not. I recognize that when I'm intensely focused on a client, just my presence seems to be healing. I think this is probably true of any good therapist. And we can transport that to the online world. He said, he went on to say, I have stressed too much the three basic conditions, congruence, unconditional positive regard, and empathic, empathic understanding. Perhaps it is something around the edges of those conditions that is the most, really the most important element of therapy, when myself is very clearly, obviously present. So when we get those people that are sort of looking like this, or looking like this, they're not present. And looking at the camera is fundamentally the importance of presence and creating humanness. Now, one of the things I do a lot of time when I'm working with my students, particularly supervisees, is I, I work hard on humanness. Um, I make a lot of jokes. Uh, it helps create relational space. And lots of people uh, talk about my humanness online. I work hard on it. I'm not sitting back giving a, a lecture like this. I'm upright, I'm focusing on you, I'm looking at the camera. I'm trying not to look too much at my slides, which are on the second screen over to the side. All these are the building blocks. And uh, I just want to go through some myths, myth busting, OK, for you to go and look at. And there's some brilliant books, not all of which I've got to hand, um, but they're all in the references. Um, but every, if everyone wants to say to you, oh, but we have to be physically present, what a load of bunkum. Th there's plenty of evidence and I've given you a, a, a reference for each we cannot work in an embodied way well that's a load of bunkum as well and Ogden and Goldstein's article on the subject is brilliant we cannot be attuned online another load of bunkum Deb Dana is flavor at the moment in the UK uh, and you might want to go and read some of her work she's done some brilliant work on working online we'll miss the non-verbal cues well yeah that's true we will, but actually other cues come up that we wouldn't get when we work face to face in some ways. Uh, and in any case, when uh, a client is lying on the couch and not looking at the therapist, there's an awful lot that's going to get missed. Our clients cannot feel really truly connected to us. Well, just see Agar's uh, chapter on the subject. 
but I know from all my work that that is not true. I have clients galore who say, I couldn't do this without my PIP. Now, my PIP is me. And I've never met some of these clients, but I have supported them through some terribly difficult times, including this year, of course, in COVID, when people are, some clients are in terrible crisis. Only the clinic room enables presence. Well, I hope even today, talking to you via uh, a disembodied video way with no people to look at, that I've helped to create a sense that this is possible. Notice how I'm passionate about what I do. And I think being enthusiastic and passionate is part of that creation of presence. Oh, I can see a typo. I hope you noticed it. Video therapy is the only effective online format. Uh, that shouldn't say that. Is It should say the opposite. I'll have to change the slide on that. It's complete rubbish. Um, sorry, it should say in-person therapy is the only effective. Oh, sorry, no, it, it was that. Video therapy is the only online format. That, that is rubbish because effectively what they're saying is that live chat, email and audio don't work. Now, I just worked with a client this year via live chat for six months. And we had a light bulb moment. I had no idea what he looked like. He had no idea what I looked like. We, we had a light bulb moment about six months in, four months in. And he suddenly said, can we turn on the video? And it showed how you could also use the different formats for progress in a therapeutic relationship. For somebody who's got shame, for example, they might never want to see you, but they may start as this person did with shame being a very major aspect. And once he'd had his light bulb moment, he wanted to see me. He wanted to talk face to face. And we went and, and we talked about that. He went on with me for another couple of months and we talked about that light bulb moment a lot because that was critical. But the building of all that relationship was in audio. OK, here's my famous slide. The online therapeutic frame equation. Uh, don't all run for the hills now. Um, and uh, this is really a summary slide about self-care. I've talked a bit about that already, about creating a safe container through adherence to the ethical frameworks and, and providing enough information for the client before therapy, working out all your risk management and all that stuff, working within the law. Understand the illusion of presence, creating that open window with the, onto the other person. Um, and the use of virtual backgrounds. Um, I, so I could change my virtual background, for example, quite easily, even mid uh, session, should I wish to. Um, and, and that can, can create a very different uh, experience. So for example, say I'm working with a, a client and, and I might choose to be on uh, my paddleboard to show that uh, we've gone somewhere else in space. Or you can't see there because I'm sitting in front of my doggy, but there we go. You see my doggy. You, each of these things create a different illusion. And uh, it's very important. So if I change to uh, this format, for example, this might look too office-like. So even thinking about, and this would be thoroughly inappropriate for, for video. A lot of fun, but inappropriate for, 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 for therapy. Um, and so, um, you know, just playing even with your virtual background can make a big difference. We talked about Roger's core conditions, the creating of a sense of humanness, uh, understanding and using the power of the digital relationship. We're going to come on and talk about disinhibition and transference, all these, all these things that are good psychodynamic techniques can all be used very effectively in the online uh, format. In fact, possibly are even more powerful. Even re uh, I, I'm thinking about rejection, misunderstandings and ruptures. And when I trained originally, remember Anne Stokes used to always say, assume goodwill. And, and that was probably one of the most important things I learned, assume goodwill. And I would encourage you all to always assume goodwill. Uh, you know, those emails that come across. Well, we might talk about those, but it's because we don't assume goodwill. 
and developing, transforming your modality to the online context. Very, very important to, 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 to do that, not just to adapt it and to turn on the, the, the video. This all happens within the context of uh, you receiving online supervision from a suitably qualified online supervisor who can help you. If you haven't had formal training, all these things will help you. To, uh, a supervisor will help to guide you and point you where you might get some extra help if you need it. And then Geller and Greenberg uh, put together a list of what might be at the, uh, the heart of the online therapeutic uh, frame in terms of presence. All these things, these are very, uh, uh, would become within um, David Levy's Mindful Tech book, for example, um, or in mindfulness, pause, relax, empty, sense, expand, notice, center, extend. These are all techniques that uh, we recognize as very important in all therapeutic traditions in mindfulness and elsewhere. I wanted to talk a little bit about disinhibition because disinhibition is something that's really very big in online therapy. And Susan Simpson, uh, in her latest article, um, um, in her section three on the Therapeutic Alliance, um, uh, having said how very effective her, uh, as, sorry, she did a lot of research on the different um, um, studies and, uh, and found that the therapeutic alliance in the context of video therapy was uh, it, at least as strong. Her other piece of uh, research found that um, it was the therapist who had the most doubt about its efficacy, not the clients. And uh, given that this is a 2020 article, I think that she still thinks that, uh, based on her research, I, I hasten to add. Um, she says on the page three of this in section three, sorry, page four, it has been found that the online therapeutic modalities can lead to greater disinhibition and openness as a result of heightened sense of safety and a more neutral power balance. OK, so just a few words on the disinhibition effect. It's a good thing and it's a bad thing. It's a benign thing, which is good, and it's a toxic thing, which is bad. Um, but the most of what Sula says, and it's Sula who coined the term, clinicians and researchers have observed how people may behave online in ways that appear quite uninhibited as compared with their usual offline behavior. For example, those emails that you send. I'm so cross about this. Send. Oh, why did I send that? OK, but it's too late. It's gone. OK, so that would be an example of toxic disinhibition. There's a lot more detail that I'm going to give you today. Um, but benign disinhibition. Um, so again, from Sula, sometimes people uh, reveal suppressed emotions, fears and wishes. They show unusual acts of kindness and generosity or go out of their way to help others. And in therapeutic terms, that will lead to a, a process of working through an attempt to, to better understand and develop oneself, to resolve into personal in, intra psychic problems, and to explore new dimensions of one's identity. And actually, I think that's an ex those are extremely useful in online therapy. Actually, they're useful in any therapy. Um, the ones that we talk about most, because they're the most toxic ones, are toxic disinhibition. So people may be rude, critical, angry, hateful, threatening, or they may visit places of perversion, crime and violence, territory they'd never explore in real life. And this can lead, for the person doing this, to blind catharsis, fruitful repetition, acting out of pathological needs. And we probably recognise this in social media all over the place, so with some terrible consequences of bullying um, for others. Um, and in terms of online, so uh, therapeutically, it's one of the reasons um, that when we're working with any text, we'd say, write your text, sit on it for 24 hours. That's the SULA 24 hour rule. Sit on it for 24 hour rules, even in email therapy. I'll write an email and I'll park it and I'll just go through it the next day. I usually make some changes to it. That I might not have had toxic disinhibition showing in that, but you can usually massively improve on something by following that rule. Um, and uh, I recommend everybody else to do that. Um, I think we, uh, in my book, uh, Psychotherapy 2.0, there's a chapter where um, 
uh, Martin Polikoff, the current chair of UKCP, and Alexander Chalkoff, uh, Chalfont, both uh, discuss client material. And Alexandra discussed uh, a couple who came to see her for client, uh, client for, for couple therapy, and then they played it all out over over social media. So this then leads into being really sure in our contracting with our clients about the need to have boundaries firmly in place about the use of social media, etc. So boundaries are really important. Online, they're incredibly important. And uh, we're just coming to a few final slides on the therapeutic frame. So uh, this is a slide put together by my colleague, Rachel Clug. And where are, where are you in the client? What space? What, is it confidential? And the therapist, closeness to the camera, what's behind you? So notice that if I'm like this, I'm way into your face. I'm not. If I'm sitting like this, I'm looking very uncomfortable. I had a supervisee recently who, who came in to me and she complained of exhaustion um, because of all her online work. And I'm just going to do something. So I've got these um, goose, they're called goose. You can get them on Amazon and they hold anything and they're flexible so you can move them around. So now you can see that I'm sitting like this because I'm looking at my camera that's up there. My finger pointing up tells you it's in the wrong place for a start. It should be below my eye level, two inches. What's that in centimeters? I don't know. That's two inches in old money. And um, so I'm looking like this. The supervisor came in to me and she said, I'm so exhausted. I, I've had to cut down on my clients. I said, why not? So after a bit, I thought, do I tell her? And so I, uh, in the end, I thought, well, this is what supervisors do. So I, um, so I've now put it back to about two inches below my eye line, and 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 I've got it straight. So we have our straight lines. Well, you would have if I didn't have a virtual background. Um, and um, she told me she was exhausted, and I said, "Well, I'm wondering. I'm finding it very uncomfortable watching you looking up at me like that because your neck is cricked. You're sitting badly on your chair." And it's like you're looking at me on the ceiling. Your camera's on the ceiling. Well, it, of course, it wasn't. It was just about a foot higher than her head. Um, and the next month, she came back and she said, thank you so much for telling me that. She said, I have felt so much better. I've ordered a new chair and, I'm, and my camera's in the right place. And I'm now not feeling nearly so exhausted. And I know I'll be able to do more. And I feel better relationally. And it was such a result to be able to do that. But, it, you know, you can't just chuck that into people you don't know. You have to build trust. And trust is an essential part, whether it's of the supervisory relationship or uh, of um, therapy. Um, and with it, once you're in that trustful situation, you can be immersed, but you have to convey safety at all times. And that they, we are in this together. I've talked about each of these aspects differently, so I'm not going to go on. And I just wanted to finish with a, a little funny here, actually, uh, for you to think about. Um, so you've got 25 pictures here, and there's only one that I think is halfway decent, but it's not even perfect. And I wonder if you know which one it is. So I'm going to tell you that possibly number four, possibly, is the best of them. There's something wrong with all the others. This one's obviously an open office. This one, you can't see anything at all. Deaf to all, any online therapist have a window behind you or beside you. She looks like she's doing something else. She just randomly has a camera turned on. This guy is probably the best, but he's got his camera leading back. So the lines are not vertical. This is a photographic trick. That's why having your camera two, two inches below your eyesight and getting everything straight is important. Um, and so on and so on. We can see all the rest of this one here is definitely off. The door is open. This one is clearly not concentrating on her client. And uh, the light's in the wrong place here and here and here and here. And she's got a fuzzy camera. Just at least teasing the camera. That would help. OK, I'm going to stop there. I have many more slides, but uh, I will do some more of those on Thursday and um, we'll um, do more practical things on Thursday. So over to you, uh, uh, Renee. 
All right. Thank you, Pip. Um, thank you for that awesome um, presentation. Um, and um, thanks, everyone, for listening in. I just wanted to um, gauge if there were any questions. And I guess I wanted to, before we hit to questions, add in my research um, on some of uh, what you are talking to. Funny enough, um, a lot of it is around presence, which is very fascinating mm. and brings in alternate research outside the therapeutic space, which is fascinating as well. Um, and um, all of that is talked about in my advanced training. So um, over to everybody, um, over to everybody if you have any questions. I think Elise is talking about she got lots of good um, tips, particularly um, the clean camera one. Um, anyone yeah, else? That's a small thing, isn't it? <laughs> It's amazing how a little small tip can make such a big difference, like clean your camera. Uh, Renny, uh, we've lost your sound. Thank you to Pip. Um, can we, um, I think we're gonna be moving over to Annette now. And yeah, just before you go, uh, what I will do on Thursday, I will continue with more of the same. I will start from here on Thursday and I've got lots of practical things. So if people don't have lots of questions to ask me, I'll have lots of uh, teaching tips to, 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 to share. Yes. Um, and I thought I'd add something to, to throw in the mix, Pip. I actually on purpose have a soft, um, a soft camera lens on purpose. I, I come from an acting background and on purpose I have a soft lens to actually engage with the um, congruence of soft um, soft skills and the spiritual approach. So that's something else I thought I'd put out there. Um, interesting. Um, yeah, so um, over to you, Annette. Hi. Hey, everyone. I will start sharing. Hopefully it will go well. We have a storm here where I'm at, um, so that's good. <laughs> Let me see. Can everybody see this? Am I muted? Hold on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it seems to be a little bit of a problem. Renee, can you hear me? Yes, are you having trouble? Yeah, it seems to be. I'm just wondering if people can 